morning and welcome to Grace Street Church this morning. Sorry that you all can't be with us here in person, but we are so thankful that you're joining us online this morning. Before we get started this morning, we want to wish Pastor Josh a great weekend as he's off with his father doing a little bit of hunting this weekend. So no music today, but we will have a great message for you this morning and communion. But before we do get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you have provided for us, Father. This past week, you have shown us your artistry with the snows that we had that didn't hamper anything but bring your beauty. And we have seen spring, and we're starting to see the leaves come out, Father, in a new beginning, which is exactly what you give us as we celebrated last week on Easter Sunday. Father, as we prepare to hear your word this morning, Father, let us truly understand that we do have a need for church life, and that need is great, Father, that, that need to be as one, together. Yes, faith is a personal relationship with you, but faith grows ever so much more abundantly when we're together. Father, thank you for this beautiful day again that you have provided for us. And let us hear your message today, in Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. So this morning, we start on week two of the Easter challenge, and that is the need for church life. And you may not believe it now, but there truly is a need for that. As you probably are realizing at home, especially if you're stuck at home, that you're getting cagey. And, and some of you might be starting to feel a little depression, but know that God is with you. As I was driving in this morning, I needed a little bit of something. And as I was praying on the way here, God provided that through a song. And there's a song that Johnny Diaz sings, and in that he says, just breathe. And in a moment, I pulled over to the side of the road, and I just breathed. Because it is hard. When you're stuck at home 24-7, you can't get out. The only time you may leave is to go to the grocery store. It's hard. And this morning, we're going to talk about the need for church life and how truly important that is so that when we are done with this pandemic, when we are allowed to come together again, that it is our prayer, both Mark and Josh and I are all praying that the church would be filled, not just our church, but all churches would be filled with people coming to hear God's word, a third great awakening, if you will. But part of the problem is, is we're kind of up against the ropes. And let me explain that a little bit more. No one is disputing that church attendance is down. Think about the last time you were at your church. Now, there are some churches, yes, that are growing, but a lot of other churches are shrinking. And that's been going on for years in America. But it's not all that straightforward. It's not just that we're declining. See, there's reasons behind it. According to Tom Rainier, the former CEO of Lifeway Christian Resources, he said this, the number one reason for the decline in church attendance is that members attend with less frequency than they did a few years ago. He said about 20 years ago, a church member was considered active in the church if he or she attended church three times a week. Today, a church member is considered active in the church if he or she attends three times a month. So you see, a large part of that change isn't fewer believers as much as it is less consistent worship. Now, the age of people going to church multiple times a week, that's in the past. That's over. It doesn't happen anymore. But there are some truly specific reasons why that happens. Now, there's a pastor, his name is Kerry Newell, and he went into several reasons as to why this trend is continuing to increase. 
even not just increased, but it's accelerated. Because in the last 50 to, to 100 years, you know, the first 70 or 80 years of that, the church, yes, it, attendance declined, but in the last 20 years, we've seen a 20% decline in Sunday attendance overall in churches in the U.S. So here's some of the reasons that he gives for that. Number one is money. It gives people options. You may not believe it, and you may not see it in your own life, but personal disposable income is on an increase. Now this you will have seen in the news, the gap between those who don't have and those who do have is growing. Because those that were in the middle are going up. But here's the problem. People are choosing to spend their money in very specific ways. And some of those ways are not, let's just say they're not the best choices in the world. But we're going to look at some of the things that people choose to spend their money on, and not just their money, their time, to understand why that church attendance is going down. And the first one that I'm going to focus on this morning is families are putting a higher focus on their kids' activities. Now, if you're my age, or maybe just a little younger, a little older, you'll remember that back when we were kids, schools didn't have activities on Sundays. And Wednesday evenings, even though there may have been a practice on a Wednesday afternoon after school, Wednesday evenings were not touched. Now there are sporting events seven days a week. And not only that, sports is beyond the schools now. It used to be that it was just a school event. It was just football, or it was just basketball, or wrestling, or track, or whatever that was. Now there are traveling teams. So remember that disposable income we were talking about? People are choosing to drive lots of miles to go here or there to take their son or daughter to a sporting event to play. So you see, with Sundays and Wednesdays no longer being considered sacred, church is on the decline. Now families are also putting more time into traveling. I remember when I was a kid, we, we waited all year for that one week vacation, two week vacation that we got to go on. And it was a big buildup to go. Today, families are taking weekend trips. They may take a, an extended weekend where they take a Friday or a Monday off and they go for a three day weekend somewhere. And with travel being so much easier today, you can hop on a plane and fly out to Vegas or down to Tampa and have a weekend away. Well, if you're out of town, you're not going to church. So weekend attendance is down. He also suggested that blended and single families often must split the amount of time families can spend at church. I have a blended family, and I understand that. Because you do split your time with your kids, with your former spouse. That's not a bad thing. Because kids need both parents in their lives. But it also means that kids are not going to be in church on Sunday every week. It may be every other week, or it may be a, a certain section of however that's broken up for those families. He also pointed out that there are many online options, as we have today, as we have now. Do you realize that churches, in the last few weeks, have created more media than Hollywood? Because they're shut down, yet we can still come together in a small setting here and set up and send this message out to you. It's, it's, it's good and bad. People can stay home. If they're not feeling well, they can stay home. You know, once this is all done, people who can't get out or, or shut-ins can 
watch a service online. And that's a good thing. But whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, we still need people around us. Mark and I were talking this morning over text, and we were excited that we were going to be able to be in the same space, although a little distance apart. We've got more than six feet going on right now, but we can be in the same space and have some fellowship, have some together time. And that's important. Now, people are also looking less and less to the church to help them spiritually. Now, let, me, let me talk to you a little bit more about that. See, think about it. What do you do if you have a question about something? Most people will grab their phone out of their pocket and they may type it in or they may just say, hey, Google. And up pops Google and starts asking, you know, what do you want? And you respond. And you tell it what you want, you look up what you want, and, and you find a resource to tell you whether that's right or wrong. But here's the thing. Everything on the internet's not true. You need people together to discuss things in a spiritual sense. Now, I know a lot of people that like to Google their symptoms if they're not feeling well. That's a dangerous, slippery slope. Most doctors will tell you that Google never went to medical school. So, be careful what you're doing online. Here's the other thing. People are more inclined to search the web than they are to go to an institution. So, a doctor, uh, a lawyer, or church. Because, you see, people see church as an institution. And in a postmodern mindset, institutions are not trusted. So if institutions are not trusted, that means people are not trusting doctors, people are not trusting uh, lawyers, they're not trusting the church. Why? Because part of that is they don't see any direct benefit. They don't see what's in it for me. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that because, honestly, church isn't about you. Your relationship with Jesus, that's about you. But church is about people coming together. And in Proverbs, it tells us that iron sharpens iron. We sharpen each other when we're together. So the next question, the next thing that popped into my mind that somebody might ask is, Pastor, what is the value of being part of Grace Street Church? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And you're going to hear a term, and we talked about this uh, last week a little bit. You're going to hear reimagined church coming from Josh, from Mark, and myself. Because the church, or the way that we do church, has not changed in a long time. Now, this book, this book, the Bible, this hasn't changed at all. We will not change a word in here. But what we do want to do is we want to show people the value of being part of a group of believers. Or being part of a group of believers, even if you don't believe, and you're questioning what this whole God and Jesus thing is about. You see, people will make time for what they value most. If people don't make time for church, then we as pastors we as a church need to take note. Why are they not? If people are engaged in the ministry of the church, they will show up. Plain and simple. 
people will show up. In fact, we talked to some, you know, family and we talked to friends about getting together prior to this whole pandemic. And when I hear, hey, we've got our, our group, our church group that night, or we've got our, our church uh, group that afternoon, praise God, be with your church group, we can get together another time because we want you to be sharpened by the gospel, by the Bible. It's seeing it from the opposite view. It means people are going to find something else to do if they don't find value, if they aren't engaged in the ministry. See, the culture is changing. And it's changing so much and so quickly, we could even call it a massive shift. Here's the last point that Kerry made. He, said, he suggested that people just don't feel guilty about missing church anymore. Let me repeat that. People don't feel guilty about missing church anymore. That's good and bad. It's good because Missing church shouldn't be a guilt thing. Missing church should be, I miss the people that are in my church. People who go to church love their church. There are many reasons that people don't feel guilty anymore. Think about what we talked about with the kids' sports. They have found things that are more important. But it's not just the kids' sports. I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that some people have to work on Sundays. And you know what? That's where this online church, where we're streaming to Facebook or we're putting it up on our, on our YouTube channel, that's where it becomes beneficial to those people. And that's a great thing, because then they don't have to miss church. Kerry, this is his last quote for this. He says, if you're relying on guilt as a motivator to get people to church, you need a new strategy. We don't want to guilt anyone into going to church. What we do want is to give them a reason to be a part of church, to go to church, to be in fellowship, to be in communion with others. And I'm really glad about that one. See, conviction is from God. Guilt isn't. Conviction is. The Holy Spirit may convict and urge you to go to church for your own good and for your own growth. Guilt is a very bad reason to be in church. Here's the thing. Church shouldn't be, and I'm, and I'm imagining the pews filled, okay? And I'm imagining a bunch of people here. And I'm also imagining them all holding a little stick with a round circle on, on it that's yellow with a happy face. And they're holding it in front of them. They're putting on a smile. And they're not letting anybody in. That's not what church is about. Church is about being together. As pastors, we are concerned about the trends. And, you know, some pastors and might even go so far as to say they're frustrated by those trends. And, and they struggle with this thing called job security. Well, here's the thing. As your pastors, and I'm going to speak for Mark and Josh right here, we're not concerned. We're not afraid. And we're not worried. You know why? Because this is the time and place that we have been placed by God on earth. In Esther chapter 4, Mordecai tells Esther, 
Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. We've been placed here for a reason. We've been put in this time for a reason because God, he doesn't do things randomly. He has a plan. We are here for just such a time as this. And God, he could have made me a pastor a hundred years ago or a hundred years from now. But he put me right here. He put me right here, right now, in this time in history of his church. And he could have placed you in his church at any of those times as well. But he put you right here with us. Listen to what 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 12 says. It, it lists the mighty men and warriors who came to fight and help King David. And in verse 32, it mentions this. It says, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. Now, maybe this verse simply means that these men understood the time that they needed to be there for David. And he, they knew that David was a much better choice than Saul. And so they aligned with David. I, perhaps they had a deep understanding or a, a fighting and a politics and a human nature, and that's why they chose David. But either way, this verse shows us that we can't ignore what is happening. We can't ignore what is happening around us. Some of us like to, to bury our heads in the sand and not pay attention to what's happening in our city or our state or our nation or the world. But the fact of the matter is, we live in a global economy, a global world, because everything everywhere depends on everybody else. If you've tried to go out and buy a new phone recently, you may have been told that well, they're out of stock. Well, yeah, manufacturing got shut down where those phones are made for a while because of this pandemic. You see how that works. So we need to seek to understand the time in which God has placed us. And we need to respond to those times with godly wisdom. That's why it's important for us to remain in the, in the Bible. We need to remain in our reading. You know, I use the, the Bible app to do my daily reading. Not so everyone out there can go, oh hey, you, did, you missed a day, or to feel guilty because I didn't, uh, I didn't read it in the morning and I let read it later in the day. No, I do that because I'm convicted on staying in the book, staying in God's Word. And that's, that's one of our challenges to you. You see, just as the men from Iskar put their lot in David's success, I can tell you that I'm putting my lot in with the local church, in with Grace Street Church for this time in history. We have some we have some big God ideas coming up. We spent some time, and, and if you were in our office, you would see two whiteboards full of all the things that we are seeing God directing us to. Now, are we going to be able to do them all at once as soon as this pandemic is over? Absolutely not. But it's giving us a roadmap, just as the Bible gives us a roadmap to life. God has given us a roadmap for our ministry, and we are excited we can't wait for this to be over, but God reminded me this morning, like I mentioned earlier, to just breathe. It's important. We have to just breathe. And, and I don't know if there's ever been a time in history when God's church has been so relevant and so desperately needed as right now. Do you realize that more people are searching online for prayer than they have in forever. Now, online hasn't been around all that long. Google's only so old. Yahoo before that. And may, many of you may have remembered Ask Jeeves. But 
people are seeking something. They're looking for the hope, the hope that they can find through God, through a relationship with Jesus. And it is our prayer that those people would find it. And that's why God placed us in this time in history, in his church. Again, we are working hard to reimagine what church is. Anyone who's worried about job security in the church as a pastor, they need to realize that the church has a lot of work to do. And it may require us, like it does for Josh and Mark and I, to have a job outside of the church. And that's okay. Because if there's the three of us, we can cover each other and cover the people of Grace Street Church. That is an awesome thing. And let me tell you this. In the 10 years that I've been in my current position, I have never once had a shift that didn't allow me to do ministry. God has always worked it out. That is God working in my life so that I can work with Mark and Josh and the people in their lives. That is amazing. And it, brings, it gives us amazing beginnings. One of the reasons I have such great hope for the church is that Jesus established it. He's the one that created it, and he promised that it would prevail no matter the times or the circumstances it faces. So right now, Jesus knew, and he said, this church will survive. In fact, listen to what he uh, he says to Peter, right after Peter rightly identified Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus says this in Matthew 16, verses 17 and 18. He says, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of heaven, or powers of hell, will not conquer it. Did you hear that? All the powers of hell will not conquer what Jesus is creating in his church, starting with Peter. In this passage in Matthew, where Jesus establishes the Christian church, the Greek word translated as church is ecclesia, which is a local assembly or gathering. So those of you that say you don't need the church, Jesus created the church. You're meant to be a part of the church. And did you know that the word church never refers to a building? It's nice that we have a place to come and gather, but it never refers to a building. It is about the gathering of the people. The people are the church. You and I are the ecclesia. We are the local gathering in the name of Jesus. And how about this? In the Greek, Peter is Petros, and rock is Petra. Jesus is making a play on words. Peter and rock. Jesus is the foundation of everything the church does, and he used Peter as the first rock or the first stone in that foundation. Peter declared, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. What a distinction he made of Jesus. And because we have that same declaration as Christians, we have made that same declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Lord of our life. Then we can also be a part of Christ's church. And that takes a lot of trust. What tremendous power and responsibility Jesus has given us as the church. In verse 19, Jesus said, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Careful how you read that passage. Let's break that down just a little bit more so you can understand why that trust is so tremendous. See, we know that only God can 
forgives sins. And only God can save people. So it doesn't give you or me the power to go down the line and basically say, you're saved, 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 not saved, saved, no way. That's not our decision. That's not for us to determine. So what does it mean that we have the power to forbid and permit things on heaven and earth? Well, you see, we've been given the keys to the lock. We've been given the keys to the kingdom to unlock the door to the kingdom for other people. So, the kingdom is open for those who share in Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And it is closed to those who reject it. So, let's just say that the gospel is like a loaded 2020 Chevy Corvette's Zeke R1. Now, I went out and I loaded up a ZR1 on the Chevy website because I just had to see. We're talking north of $150,000 for a loaded ZR1. And it is a truly beautiful piece of machinery. And it's got a lot of power. But how about this? The gospel has power and it needs to get the job done. Just like that Corvette will get the job done of what you want it to do. It may get you a ticket or two, but it'll get the job done. It'll get you from A to B where you need to be. But the gospel, it takes us from birth, but not just to death, it takes us to eternity. It gets us where we can't even get ourselves. And you can't make that Corvette go any faster. Can you imagine opening up the door, putting your foot up, and trying to make it go faster? You can't do it. Now, I had a, a, I had a smaller, it wasn't even a version of the Corvette. I had a Chevette. All right. Back in the early, I had a, a, an early 80s Chevette, and, and I didn't have a lot of money at the time. Guess what? The starter went up. It was a four-speed. Guess what? I could roll that thing uphill in the snow, pop the clutch out of, while I'm in third, and get it going. And I did that for six months to make it go. But then once it was going, there was nothing I needed to do to help. We can help the gospel get going by sharing it with others. But the power of the gospel to get things done and to get people where they need to be is only in the gospels. Jesus values us so much that he wants us to be in a relationship with us more deeply than you can even imagine. And he wants us to be a part of his work. He says, here's the gospel, here's the keys, where are you going to take it? The gospel has the power to bring freedom, to break chains. It does things that we can't do. Those chains of sin that you've been trying to rip away, you can't do it by yourself. But if you allow God to do it, if you allow Jesus into your life, those chains will be broken and you will be freed. The door to the kingdom is then open. The church has the authority to bring the full power and truth of heaven to a hurting and sinful world. Not just leave it parked in the garage. You see, think of it this way. The gospel is not something that you back out of the garage and you take and you clean it up and you make it, you get all the dust off of it and you polish the, the interior and you wax the outside of it and you get it to where it just sparkles. And then you roll it back into the garage and close the door. Now, the gospel, we wanna, we wanna pull that out. We wanna take it for a drive and we wanna, we wanna use it to the best of its ability. And, and guess what? If it gets a rock chip in the windshield or a door ding, so be it. The gospel's meant to be used, not hidden away. We need to take the keys 
come screaming out of the driveway, put the pedal down, and see what the gospel of Jesus Christ has under the hood. We need to see the freeing power of Jesus in this world, in this time, right now. We need it in our community, we need it in our state, our nation, and the world. It's going to get messy. It always does. And you know what? That's okay. The gospel was meant to change the world. And it can't do that if we don't take it out of the garage. We've been given the keys to the kingdom. So we are going to take it forward by his power under the protection of his grace and through the leading of his spirit so that whatever we permit here on earth, by his power may be permitted in heaven for all of eternity. So you see, it's not about, if I allow this sin on earth, it'll be allowed in heaven. No, it's not that. It's about taking the keys and sharing the gospel with others, getting it out of the garage, and taking it and sharing it. And when we do that, the gates of hell cannot stand against us. And that is why we are better together. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have heard people say, I hate organized religion. Well, guess what? I ain't a fan of organized religion either. And I understand why you're not. See, it's not about organized religion. Religion. Organized religion is, it's legalistic. It's about a bunch of rules. It's about, you have to do this, this, and this to go to heaven. Or you need to do this, that, and the other thing to be a believer. And it's much easier than that. That's saying that we can do it under our own power. Remember, I just said we can't make the power of the gospel any more powerful. It's as powerful as God has made it, and we can't touch that. But throughout history, as a church, we have forgotten the mission and the purpose. And I'm not talking about a mission statement that a church created or a purpose statement that the church created. I'm talking about the mission and purpose that Jesus gave us for the church. See, we too often think that the church is about the structure and the hierarchy when it's about the people that we are called to reach. But organized religion isn't all that. You know why? Because it organizes us as a group of believers to be more powerful to go out and help each other, to reach people the gospel. When we organize, we get things done. See, I can pastor a church, and Mark can pastor a church, and Josh can pastor a church, but as a group, together, we have the ability to have a greater impact, not just on Bray Street, but on the community in which we live. God calls us to gather together to find ways to live and share and spread the truth and power of the gospel. We have a common mission, and it can't be completed without one another. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. He says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Use your gifts. Don't know what your gifts are? Well, we can help with that. But that's another sermon and another Bible study, and we'll, we'll touch on that another time. See, you can get things done by yourself. But imagine if you bring a group of people together to do that. Say you need to paint your house. Well, you can go ahead and paint your house. Think about how long it's going to take you to paint it. 
Now think about the way the Amish put a barn up. They all come. And they can put a giant barn up in a day. Together we can do so much more. And that's what the body of Christ is about doing. Our different gifts work in conjunction with each other. And it opens up ministry. It opens up gospel opportunities that we are we haven't even imagined. They're not even on our whiteboard yet because we haven't imagined them yet because you haven't maybe been in our ministry or part of our ministry. We are praying for the people that we need for the different ministries that we have been given so far by God. And you know what? Those people may not even be part of our church yet. Yet. God has a plan. Now, you can't be all about you were created to be without us, and we can't be all you're created to be without you. You know, we have to be together. In order to, for us to be created, God created us. He created us to be together. And in order to be together, then we can do things. The trends may say that church attendance is down, but we don't have to be subject to the trends of our culture. In fact, we are called to change and shape our world together with the power of the gospel. But that doesn't mean going out and being mean to people. That means going out and loving on people. Showing what Jesus showed. Because if we go out and we're mean to people, do you think they want to hear what you have to say to them about the gospel? No. We are not called to change the gospel either. You will never hear Mark or Josh or I change what is in the Bible. We will only give you relevant examples today of the scriptures. God has given us the power to come together. In fact, in Hebrews 10.25, God tells us not to neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. But pastor, it's been drawing near for 2,000 years. Well, guess what? Jesus didn't even know when he was coming back. God's timing. He doesn't want anyone that he knows is out there that will accept him as their, as his, as their Lord and Savior. He doesn't want anybody to mess out. So he's going to wait until everybody that he knows is going to accept him, has accepted him. We know your lives are already busy, and adding something else could be hard. Okay? We get that. What we are suggesting is that we all make the work of the kingdom of God a priority in our lives, since that is the only work that matters. So ministry, it doesn't just happen in this building. It doesn't just happen on a Sunday worship service. It doesn't just happen on a Wednesday night Bible study. It happens when I go to work. And even though I'm working from home right now, it happens over the phone as I'm helping people. Ministry happens all the time. 24-7, regardless of where you are, because you and I, we're the church. And we need the church. We need each other. You're not going to go up in flames if you show up at church. You're not going to be judged if you show up at Grace Street. We all have our skeletons in the closet, so to speak, but guess what? Those skeletons aren't there anymore because Jesus took them away for us. As Pastor Mark has said before, don't take your sins and all your garbage and your baggage and put it at the foot of the cross and walk away and get halfway out the building and turn around and come back and get them. That defeats the purpose. We need to gather together to get things done, to sharpen one another. We need to find in the Bible the scriptures that show us that the followers of Jesus we're meant to be fueled by, equipped by, and connected to a local church. Colossians 3.16, Paul says, Let the message about Christ in all its riches fill your lives, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives, sing psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. See, the message of Christ lives in us, his church. Again, it's not about sitting in the pews and listening to a message and then going home and going about your business. The gospel lives within us. We need to share that. We need to, we're called 
to go deeper into our relationship with Jesus, to experience greater freedom in His Spirit, and to undergo a more complete transformation into His likeness. And I can tell you what, the people that are part of Grace Street Church, they all have a story to share with you. We all have a story. We've all seen God work immensely in our lives and turn us around. So, in the next line where it says, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives, some versions say teach and admonish, admonish, while others say teach and instruct. Admonish means to, to caution, to correct or urge. It doesn't mean to beat him over the head. Counsel means to consult or advise. And instruct means to give knowledge, teach, train, educate. So you see, no matter which version you're reading, they all basically have the same message. We're here to bring the message of Christ and, and to help you through those, those times in your lives. This is both frightening and at the same time a very powerful thing about coming together regularly. You might even say we're all a little bit home blind. We put our blinders on. We, we don't see sometimes what's happening around us, or we choose to ignore those things. Well, we all have those different blind spots, and we all have different experiences, and we all have different strengths and weaknesses. I can remember when I was a youth pastor. Most of the youth pastors that I hung out with and knew, they all played guitar. So I felt like maybe I wasn't as good a youth pastor as I could be because I couldn't play the guitar. No. No, I had my own gifts and my own talents. That the kids that God put me in their lives needed more than they needed somebody to play the guitar. Because you know what? Like I said, our worship leader come down and lead some songs before we through. Found a way around it. All done. That's again, we're coming together means we have more ability to get things done. It reminds me of a couple who are having trouble remembering things. So just a little story for you. See, during a checkup, the doctor tells them that they're physically okay, but they might want to start writing things down to help them remember. Okay. So later that night, while watching TV, the man gets up from his chair. Want anything while I'm in the kitchen, he asks. Will you give me a bowl of ice cream? Sure. Don't you think you should write it down so you can remember it, she asks. No, I can remember a simple bowl of ice cream. Well, I'd like some strawberries on top, too. Maybe you should write it down. You remember? He says, I can remember that. You want a bowl of ice cream with strawberries. I'd also like whipped cream. I'm certain you'll forget that. Write it down. Irritated, he says, I don't need to write it down. I can remember it. Ice cream with strawberries and whipped cream. God, for goodness sakes. About 20 minutes later, the man returns from the kitchen and hands his wife a plate of bacon and eggs. She stares at the plate for a moment and looks at it and says, where's my toast? You see, like the couple, one of our biggest problems is that we need constant reminders of this truth. There's so much in this world that is questioning, so much that is contradicting and attacking the truth. When we gather here, we're reminded of the truth of God's word, the truth of who God is, and the truth of who we are in Jesus. I'm not concerned with how people attending church less often makes our appearance appear. I'm concerned that if we stop meeting together, that the truth will quietly slip from the forefront of our minds, and we'll almost, without realizing it, buy into and live according to the lies of this world. One thing that the kids in, in the youth group that I had the privilege of leading knew is that even if just one of them showed up, we would still have time together. Now, sometimes that time included just walking a few blocks up to the Dairy Queen and having some ice cream together. But in that time together, time that we could remember the truth together and stay in the Word, it amazes me how I can forget or question God's goodness sometimes. Sometimes we question His power and His love and His involvement in our lives. And that's easy to do right now when you're sheltered at home. 
guess what? God is good. God is powerful. He loves you immensely. And he is still involved in your life. Gathering here every week with you, whether in person or online, that keeps my life on track. keeps our lives on track when I meet with our group, which we haven't been able to do. I think we're going to have to break up Zoom or something similar to that to meet with those folks. Because I feel lost when we're not together, and I hear that over and over again from the people here. I feel lost when we're not together. And even though we're not together right now, I know we're together in spirit, and it reminds me why it is so hard to be a I would much rather to have you all here. But I'm glad I can be with you in your living room or wherever you're at right now. When we get together, we are able to bring real help and support for life's difficulties. And I have to believe that you, like me, have figured out that life is hard and even more so right now. The fact is, we're going to feel like this for a while. We're going to feel like we've been run through the proverbial ringer. And if you wonder where that comes from, tell you, my grandma had an old Maytag washer and dryer that was two tubs. And on the washer, there were two rollers that she would take, them, take it out of the, the water and she would put it in those rollers. Now, the older ones had a crank. Hers had an electric motor on it. And when you're seven years old or six years old and your fingers get caught in that, yeah, it hurts just a little bit. That's where that comes from. We feel like we're being taken through the ringer. But even in the worst times, even in the harshest things, God will bring blessing. When times are tough for you, I want you to know that we, not just your pastors, but your church family, is here for you. Right now, we're still praying over every single one of you, and we receive prayer requests all the time. And we are trying, we're getting those out as fast as possible to our prayer warriors and those who want to hear it and be a part of that so that we can pray over people. What a beautiful thing it is that we can, even though we can't get together in person, we're still able to get together in spirit and extend the grace and the care that God has for each other and for all of us. So here's your call to worship. Because there's an even more important reason that we should get together each week. And it's not because of you, and it's not because of me. It's about our Creator and our Savior. Every week we come together, here or online, we pray, we read His Word, we worship, we sing. Why? Not for our benefit. Because God is worthy of our praise. We need to worship God. In 1 Chronicles 16, 29, it says, Give to the Lord the glory He deserves. Bring your offering and come into His presence. Worship the Lord in all His holy splendor. To worship is to declare who God is and what place He has in our lives. And as we make that declaration, and our hearts and minds get lined up with the truth, we worship. Worship transforms us. C.S. Lewis wrote this, In the process of being worshipped, God communicates his presence to men. He communicates his presence to us when we worship. And even though we are not together right now, we're together in spirit. It is hard to be apart. I want to be together with you. Mark wants to be together with you. Josh wants to be together here. But I have to believe that there is even more coming. That God has a greater plan through this. That the blessing he's going to bring is going to be bigger than anything we can even imagine. And as we worship together, we will grow nearer to God. And as you can see in the Bible, anyone who comes close to God is changed forever. Jesus told us in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. We get together to draw near to God. It, it makes us grow closer together. It's an essential part of our faith 
and our relationship, that personal relationship with him. But even if worship did absolutely nothing for us, because there are many people who say, I go to church and I get nothing out of it. Are you truly listening? Are you truly letting God into your life? Are you truly allowing God to communicate with you? A.W. Tozer said, sometimes I go to God and say, God, if thou dost never answer another prayer while I live on this earth, I will still worship thee as long as I live and in the ages to come for what thou hast done already. God's already put me so far in debt that if I were to live one millennium or one million millennium, I couldn't pay him for what he's done for me. God isn't suffering from low self-esteem. He doesn't need our worship or our praise. He deserves it. Our time together provides that opportunity. There's nothing like the church when it's working right. But when it's not, it's heartbreaking. It's tragic. And too often we see it. We aren't going to let that happen. Is there anything more disappointing than a gathering of believers who have decided to park the gospel in the garage to keep it clean and safe and pure? It's an amazing honor. It's an amazing trust and privilege that God has given to us. Do you see how highly he thinks of us as part of his ecclesia, his gathering of believers? It's up to all of us to do our very best to make sure it's working right. We also have to understand that the local church isn't just a building, and it's certainly not about us as your pastors. It's not about the staff, it's not about the deacons, it's not about the elders, or even for other churches, it's not about the denomination. It is about a gathering, an assembly of the followers of Jesus Christ, who are united by love for him. We planted Grace Street Church and this is exactly how we felt then and how we feel now. When it's working right, the church is where everyone, every individual in the gathering takes his or her place in the ecclesia, in the gathering, in the group, with a determination to take the keys of the kingdom and charge forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of his name and for the freedom of his people. For the sake of the health of the church, for the sake of your own growth, for the sake of those we are called to reach, we challenge you to be a part of the church. And join us every week through the remainder of this series and even beyond that. And I would go even one step further and I challenge you to share this on social media. Share on your Facebook, share on your Twitter, your Instagram, your LinkedIn, whatever it is, whatever you have. To email somebody a link. Have them listen to this series and to the rest of the words that you will hear from, from us. Because we're going to take the gospel, we're going to take it out of the garage, we're going to hit the gas, and we're going to go. When this pandemic is over, keep your feet in the door or inside the car. Because <laughs> we're going to be racing forward. Reimagine with us what the church is. Not that the gospel is going to change, because it's not. But reimagine what the church is and how it is forever relevant and forever powerful. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for your love letter to us. It seems at times that the church has a black eye. That the church is beaten up by our culture. But the church is still your bride, Father, and we know that. We pray that you would help us become the church that you had in mind when you created it. When Jesus said, you, Peter, you are the rock in which I will build my church. Help us to grow together and to take our place in this gathering in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank you.
thank you for that message, Pastor Terry. It was an excellent message. As we come into our time of communion, as we are normally gathered together, we practice communion by the ancient practice of intention, which means we take the bread and, and we break the bread, and dip it into the cup and take it. So if you would like to partake in communion, even as we live stream our videos, please let us know. And we have communion cups available here uh, with wafers that you can go ahead and participate. So on the night that Jesus was given up, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup. And after he blessed it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. And each time that we take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. This is our ability to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us. This is our opportunity to share in that sacrifice that Christ made for us. This is our opportunity to gather together as a community of believers in unity with one another to share in that blessing of that sacrifice of Christ, the body and the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we praise you and thank you for your glorious wonders that you surround us with each and every day. We praise you and thank you for the blessings that you give us each and every day. Lord, for the opportunity to gather together here today in your name. And though even we're apart from each other right now, Lord, you gather us together in unity through our hearts, through our love for you, through our common belief in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the hedge of protection that you put around us, for the opportunities that you bless us with each and every day to reach out to others in your name, for them to understand and for them to be blessed by your promises, your truths, your gifts. Lord, we just go about our business this week and we ask for you to be with us hand in hand as we go through our lives. Help us to be safe. Help us to bless others in that process. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. 